on this episode of Northwest Outdoors. Head to British Columbia, Canada and go fly fishing with fishing host Hobart Mans. We're here on the mainland of British Columbia on the west coast shore and we're fishing at the end of a fjord. We're here with guide Glenn and fishing instructor Chris. They're going to show me how to catch these fish and we hope to see sea run dolly varden and sea run cutthroats and they should run from 14 to 20 inches. They're not going to be huge, but they will be very active fish when the tide turns. They're going to come to us. They're going to come up to the head of these pools on the stream that we're in. This is one of those places you dream about going to, and it's really very, very exciting to be here. This is a pretty fish. It's a Dolly Varden. It's not yeah. a cut. This is sometimes called a bull trout. Also, visit the Indian village Alert Bay, where you can find the world's largest totem pole. And by the well, end of this show, you'll learn how to cook crab, crab the right way. Crab. And, uh, or just one side, and just rip it. Um, so uh, the shell uh, separates from the legs, and, and the body comes off, okay? <laughs> Funding for Northwest Outdoors is made possible in part by Kershaw Knives of Portland, Oregon, makers of precision tools and cutlery. Kershaw Knives strongly supports outdoor programming as well as responsible outdoor activities throughout the Pacific Northwest. And by Subaru, engineered and designed for all types of activities in the great outdoors. Subaru believes that enjoyment of the Pacific Northwest should be available to everyone. And by Energy Northwest, providing electricity for the Pacific Northwest today and for our future. You too can help provide electricity for our future by reducing your use of electricity today. Remember, conserve whenever possible. And by Alltrek.com. Alltrek provides high performance clothing and gear for every outdoor experience, including paddling, camping, hiking, climbing, and more. Information can be found online at Alltrek.com. clear streams and bays, abundant wildlife, and native history are earmarks of this rugged area near North Vancouver Island. This is Berry Island and the home to Farewell Harbor Resort. This guest lodge sits in Blackfish Sound and in the front yard some of the most scenic inland fly fishing in the world. Only a small plane trip from Seattle's Lake Washington, Farewell Harbor is home base to world-class salmon fishing as well as opportunities to view wildlife up close. Kenmore Air operates the air taxis into this area, touching down right at the resort dock. With only half the day spent flying in, there's plenty of time for a shot at one of the local fly fishing holes. A number of coves and inlets are a small boat ride from the lodge, allowing quick access and a chance to soak in the grandeur of the area. Here is Northwest Outdoors fishing host, Hobart Manns. Got another one of those beautiful cutthroats on. I had seen this one rise about twice straight across from me and we got the third cast into it. We're still at the head of Bond Sound and one of these virgin streams catching wild native cutthroats. And this one's probably 10, 11 inches and I'm gonna bring him up here and see if we can't get a good look at him. Come on, fish, get over here. Oh, he's got great color. Just absolutely spectacular color. I'm gonna see if I can get him over here. So I can, oh, come on, come on, come on. That's the kind of fish that these streams up here carry. Large heads, little slender body, but they're just wild and vibrant. 
you won't find a prettier cutthroat in the whole wide world. Getting to the cutthroat trout and the Dolly Varden into these streams and inlets can be tricky. A lot depends on the access due to the tide changes. The water can creep up very quickly. Up here one of the important things to remember is the tides. If you're up here all the fish are associated with tides, either incoming, outgoing, slacks, ebbs, and in these creek mouths in particular, the incoming tide will bring in feeding fish from the ocean salt water, and they'll forage up the mouth of these streams for a given distance, find what they can to eat, and drop back out as the tide drops back out. So if you're fishing, look for your tide book. Try to follow the tides up the streams, fish them back down, and you'll have much better luck if you pay attention to what the moon, the tides, and everything out in Mother Nature is telling you. Trust me, fish that incoming tide, you'll catch a lot of fish. It turned out that this isolated spot was a good idea from the resort's top guide, Glenn Speed. He also brought along California fly fishing instructor, Chris Menadier. Chris shares some tips on how to fish these conditions. Unlike a conventional freestone stream or spring creek, where you would look at a pretty obvious place where fish might be holding and work it, and then having had no success, move on, this is tidal water. Theoretically, I can stand here and cast in the same spot hour after hour as the incoming fish intercept where I'm standing. But I'm going to do a little bit of both. I'm going to be casting across the current, paying out a little bit of line as we go down, trying to keep a little action on the fly. And I'm going to take a chance that by swinging the fly across the current, I'll be coming across the path of the incoming fish, trying to cover as much water as we can. That's the phrase, cover the water. Fish on. I got a stout fish here. What a spot. This is beautiful. First pass. This guy's giving all he can handle on this 5X tip that I got here. Look at that beautiful fish. First cast up there. Slam bang. Right down Main Street. Whoa! Thank you. There's a main current coming right after that deadfall, and between that and the far bank, a lot of deep water, a typical holding point for a fish. So I threw the nymph above where I thought they would be, giving it a chance to sink somewhat, and it went about 10 or 15 feet, and it just stopped. Look at that gorgeous animal. Look at this. That is a sea-run cutthroat of major proportions. Look at this. The fly we're using today is a little pink and red and silver mylar with some tinsel in there thrown in on a size eight hook. Uh, the cutthroat really seemed to be loving this. All the fish we've caught have been on this pattern. I'm using about a four weight tippet, four pound tippet. The rod is a five weight, the line's a five weight, and the fishing is at least a 10 weight. Ooh, there was a strike on the surface as I lifted the fly up. Another one, another one there on the surface. See that? Maybe they want me to keep it up on top of the water. We'll strip instead of drifting it, okay? Watch this. We'll maintain surface presentation by stripping hard and not giving the line a chance to sink. Give it a little bit of uh, animation here by some herky-jerky stripping. Yes. This is not quite as large, but they liked it on top, and he has two fish chasing him, trying to get the fly out of his mouth. This is unbelievable. Another nice clean hookup. See that right in the lip? And what do we have? We have another cutthroat. Now this is a male. See the difference in the jaw? Comes back under the eye. 
It's a deeper mouth. Just how much or how basic equipment could a person get into fly fishing for? Or what's the basic needs? Well, actually the best combination would be something in the eight and a half to nine foot length in a five or six weight. Um, that would mean a five or six weight rod and its companion five or six weight line, preferably a weight forward and floating line because it's more flexible and diversified in use than the sinking lines are. And I'm happy to report that these days you need to spend 600 bucks for a decent rod. The uh, industry has finally gotten their senses and are putting out very adequate equipment. You're carrying a rod from the Heritage Group out of uh, Springfield, Mass. That rod retails for about $105. Doesn't have to be 600. Yeah, so you figure that the average person, rod, reel, and line, good equipment uh, beginner could go into it for a couple of hundred dollars and I be adequately so armed? As a coincidence, the reel that I would recommend is this Tioga from the Teton people in California. And you would never need to move up from either that rod or this reel as you went through your fly fishing career because they're highly adequate, perfectly presentable, very functional, and a lot less than people seem to feel. I think a very adequate line to go with this rod and reel we're talking about would cost in the vicinity of $45. And as I mentioned before, it would be a weight forward floating line. They would be the most useful kind to get. Well, so basically the, the basic needs we're looking at, single action reel, a graphite or composite rod, a good line, yes. good coated floating or sink tip line. Correct. And probably a floating line for a beginner. Yep, and then leaders and flies he could get all the equipment he needs to start in for a couple of hundred bucks and he don't necessarily have to have waders. You can fish an awful lot of water yes, of course. with just a pair of old boots. And indeed some of these fishermen that are coming into fly fishing may have a lot great deal of experience and have already had a lot of this equipment already. Yeah. Now there's one question I got to ask you okay. because it bothers me. I collect antique tackle and we find something all the time that fly fishermen used all the time that's disappeared. It's supposed to be under your arm and it's a creel and how come fly fishermen don't use them anymore. Happily for the whole sport, we've learned to understand that a, a wild trout, as Lee Wolf used to say, is simply too gorgeous to catch only once. So we put them back. Okay. It's called catch and release. You don't need a creel for that. No. Well, do you tell me where your old creel is because I want to be there for the garage sale. Okay. <laughs> and another big fish. Jumper. This is great fishing right here. Dandy. Another cutthroat. There's one out there now. Oh, yes. Come on. Another cutthroat. Again. Oh, yeah. Dandy. Look at that beautiful Dolly Varden bull trout. There it is. Another cutthroat fresh out of the Pacific Ocean. That's as pretty as they get. I am getting a chase for a hit, and there's another one. Look at this on every retrieve. This guy is gonna be in this little river for a number of years and get bigger and bigger. Got that big daddy right up there. Right where he was supposed to be. Oh, there's his little brother. Probably weigh a little over a pound, probably 14 inches. But the neat part was that he was absolutely where he was supposed to be. Come on, baby, let's get it. Ooh, he wants out of here. He's a dandy fish, just dandy. But anyway, the cast was above that rock above us, and we brought it down to it. You notice how they blend into the, the current. You see them one second, can't see them another second, the moss and vegetation around him really camouflage those fish very, very well. Now I'm gonna try and bring him up here and turn him loose like a professional. I'm probably gonna turn him loose like an amateur. But he is a gorgeous, gorgeous fish. Just gorgeous. Get that leader up here. Lay that line down. Ooh, that's a band. Just a dandy. Now he's gonna get off. Fishing in these virgin British Columbia streams is a wonderful thing. Everybody should get a chance to do it. It reminds me of my youth and childhood when all the streams in the Northwest were somewhat like this. So if you get a chance, come up to British Columbia, find someone who can take you to a virgin coastal stream and see what cutthroat fishing is really all about.
this land of towering mountains and abundant wildlife is where the cruise ships frequent. A sense of ruggedness surrounds every aspect of this part of Canada's British Columbia. After a day of fly fishing for cutthroat trout and Dolly Varden, it was time for a tour of the nearby historic Alert Bay. Home to the native Namgi Indian tribe, life here revolves around the water, and the native history is evident everywhere. A small coastal community, Alert Bay depends on the fishing industry, where vessels like the Glenda Lynn have spent many hours hauling in the catch. These are scenes of everyday life in a small fishing village, where history meets modern technology head on. History and heritage are important here, as evident on the edge of town at the Namgi Burial Grounds. Generation old totems sit as centuries overlooking the bay. A new addition to the town is the newly constructed Longhouse, built right next to the world's largest totem pole. At 173 feet, it can be seen for miles. The Umista Cultural Center in Alert Bay will also enlighten a visitor of the rich flavor of the native artwork. Faces, old and new, change, but the traditions do not in coastal Indian villages like Alert Bay. Back at Farewell Harbor, there's still time to pull in some fresh crab for the evening's dinner. Resort owner Paul Weaver takes out Hobart to pull a couple of crab pots. Pot's pretty heavy. That means that's that should be a good sign. Well, we'll get it up here and see what we got. Hey, banana! Hey. Get it oh, up there. You go. Get it up. All right, here we go. So many of Hey, that is now that's that's, that's a good. One of the things that we wanted to show our viewers is the difference between a male and a female crab. This long slender stem here in the bottom shell indicates a male, and the broad, wide width one, uh, shorter and broader, is a female. That's that's where all the baby things are. It goes on. Right. There. So we're going to turn the females loose. We're going to keep these big six and a half inch, six and three quarter inch males for dinner. Six and a half. Six and a half. Six and a half. <laughs> All right, we can do that, Paul. All right, we'll tell I, you. I might add that on the females, no matter what the size, we don't keep them. They go back. Legally, you can keep them. We, we do not. But anyway, we've done very well. This is probably one of the nicest crab pots that I've seen come up in a long, Here's long time. Here's another male. It's another, another male. And I'd say that's just about legal. It's broken off, but that it's about my hands. I've bad as they are, I can tell. That's that's a legal crab. All right, let's take them home and eat them. All right, sir. Toby, the lodge's chef, shows us how to prepare them the right way. And how are we going to do it? Well, what we're going to do is we're just going to grab uh, either side of this crab, and uh, or just one side. And just rip it um, so uh, the shell uh, separates from the legs and, and the body comes off. Okay, so half separates. 
not. He comes off. He says it happens easily. It, very, it happens very easily. There we go. Half. And, th and then we do the other side the same way. Half. And there we are. Now all we have to do is rinse that. We've got some water right here, I think. We've got water We rinse that off. We take also take the gills out. Yep. Clean the gills out and just take some of the, uh, the other insides out, as well as taking the uh, part of the mouth off. So we're going to get this brown stuff in the gills out. That's correct. You clean them better than I do. Finished cleaning all these crabs now. Uh, the next step is? Putting, putting these in the water. Uh, we're going to boil these in um, a salted water uh, for about 15 minutes. Um, and uh, after they're uh, finished and cooked, uh, we're going to take them out, put them in the refrigerator for about five hours, and then uh, we're going to serve them cold this evening. Uh, we're going to have a little barley dish uh, as well uh, served with a crab. Now, I know that they're going to be done because what, they'll change color? They, they, ch they ch change to a, uh, a pinkish uh, hue uh, after about uh, 10 minutes, and then we just like to cook them just a little bit longer. Okay, so they're going to be in there about um, 15 to 20 minutes. Then. 15 to 20 minutes. Crack and eat, and then there's crack and store. Illegally. There's a lot more adventure from Blackfish Sound and Farewell Harbor in British Columbia coming up on the next Northwest Outdoors. Hobart heads out for some Chinook salmon fishing. But he's keeping his head down, and now he does. Now he doesn't like that reel. Oh yeah, he put a little head snap to that. Oh yeah, look at that baby run, run, run! <laughs> Crazy. Crazy fish. Also, take a walk through historic Telegraph Cove, where you can rent out old refurbished maritime cabins. Plus, go fishing with the eagles. Guide Glenn Speed takes Hobart out for some black bass fishing. Oh, there you go. There it was, too. Right on cue. Look at that spin in the line oh, here. Oh, yeah. That's a scrappy one. Glenn just dropped that lure in there, and it went bam. That is a, he's putting up Yeah, I think he might. Muscle. I have a funny he feeling he's wrapped around the kelp. The kelp. Yeah. It's like in the mold of the slack. Got some scars on them here too, like a lingcod grabbed them. See the little mark right there and the fins all. Something grabbed a hold of them. And that was probably only about 10 feet deep, right along the kelp bed there. We've noticed in our teaching experiences that there are some students who are especially delightful and successful to work with, and others not so. In the case of people like myself, my age, my gender, they're tough students. Been there, they've done that. They have a difficult time having people tell them what to do. It takes a hard, long, intense lesson to get the point across. By contrast, my favorite students are professional students, that is to say, young boys or girls in the ages of 12 to 15. What they do every day is absorb information. They learn. They're wonderful students. I love working with them. And for you men out there, you ought to worry about the fact that this is a sport that women are better at than we are. This is a sport of finesse, and patience, and fine motor control, things we aren't really famous for. You'll probably see a great many more women coming into the sport in the years to come. And I hope they realize that it is really not only fun, not only a vehicle for going to pretty places, but very easy to do. Go online to northwestoutdoors.org to learn more about this show, 1505. Funding for Northwest Outdoors is made possible in part by Kershaw Knives of Portland, Oregon. 
makers of precision tools and cutlery. Kershaw Knives strongly supports outdoor programming as well as responsible outdoor activities throughout the Pacific Northwest. And by Subaru, engineered and designed for all types of activities in the great outdoors. Subaru believes that enjoyment of the Pacific Northwest should be available to everyone. The growth of the Pacific Northwest